Ever since I started this YouTube series, I've had a handful of film recommendations thrown at me that I've ended up reviewing. Movies such as Cool Cat Saves the Kids and The Fanatic have proven bacterial breeding grounds for social commentary. And yet one film people keep asking me to review is The Room. The thing is, I love that movie. The Room is perhaps the ultimate good-bad movie. But everyone talks about it. Every critic of good-bad movies talks about The Room. And yet, not enough people have actually spoken about its low-budget homosexual equivalent. <laughs> Delightfully devilish, Seymour. Yes, everybody, welcome back to Delightfully Devilish, the show where we discuss films that all at once meet the criteria of being the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm your host, Jukebox Harry, and today we are looking at a film widely considered to be the worst homosexual themed movie of all time. Ben and Arthur is a 2002 homosexual themed romantic drama film written by, directed by, starring, and produced by Sam Moravich, among many other jobs, none of which he got right. This film came out in 2002, a year before the release of The Room in 2003, so one could argue that this movie was The Room before The Room. To say Ben and Arthur is bad is a tremendous understatement. If you took The Room and you took out all the passion, sincerity, and even what little production values it actually had, you'd have something relatively close to Ben and Arthur. Now, I love The Room, but... Ben and Arthur, on the other hand, was such a boring slog of an experience that I don't want to subject you to actually watching the film. That's why I'm here to cut it down to a highlight reel and just to focus on a couple of its bad aspects. But then again, I guess that's kind of the entire point of this series. There's your first sign of the film's problems. It uses a free public domain recording of the song The Entertainer as its intro theme. And it's, uh, it's a very rough version as well. Wait. Wait, I can do this. Sam Ravitch apparently did everything for the film. His name pops up in the intro credits more times than the name Carson Clay popped up in the film within a film from Mr. Bean's Holiday. So if there's anyone to blame for this film, it is him. Hello. And the first shot in the film confirms that he has no idea about cinematography. The TV just broke. I've been down here just taking a nap. <sighs> Forget the stupid TV. Did you try, try the radio? Maybe it's being broadcast over the radio. Hello? Arthur. Arthur. News, it's been a long battle here in Hawaii. The public has long awaited the final decision of the court of Hawaii, and the courts have voted yes. Homosexuals do have the right to get married. The sound quality of that is so rough, it actually takes a bit of work to decipher what he's saying. And then the film just cuts to five hours later. Wow, that was very abrupt. Ben and Arthur are a gay couple who want to get married, and with gay marriage having been just legalized in Hawaii, they can finally follow through on that. So they pack their bags in an impromptu montage where Ben doesn't even remove his shirt from a coat hanger. That's just gonna take up space. You can even see the actual tripod used for the film in the background here. So I guess Maravich was responsible for continuity because he fucked that up just like everything else in the movie. And this montage casually ends with a fade to black. This film does that a lot. You can make a game of drinking every time it happens. The judge has put a stay on his decision allowing gays to marry in the state. That means it is no longer legal for gays to marry in the state of Hawaii until a further decision is made in the state supreme court. Oh no. What do you want to do? Why aren't you upset is what I'd like to know. I am upset. Oh, but you sure don't seem like it. I think that's because that's the maximum amount of emotions that he can actually express, but you're right, he definitely doesn't seem upset. Look, in another two years... Ah, uh, fuck in another two years, Ben! This is ignorance and completely unfair! This country fucking sucks, it just fucking sucks! I've seen this raw strength only once before. It didn't scare me enough then. It does now. And you know what? If we ever get into a war and they draft my ass, the first thing I'm gonna tell them is if I'm not good enough to get married in this country, then I sure as hell ain't dying for it. If anyone drafts you for the military, they should definitely be fired. We've been together for three years. And, uh... I'm still finishing up a divorce with my wife. So, you guys definitely don't have good communication, is that what you're saying? Dear Slim, I wrote you but you still ain't calling. I left my cell, my pager, and my home phone at the bottom. I sent two letters back in autumn, you must not have got them. Also, just look at how messy the apartment is. That is a recurring problem throughout the film. Ravage never bothered to clean the place up to make the movie, he just shut it there. There's somebody at the door. There's somebody at the door. There's somebody at the door. I want a divorce. 
What brought that on? I'm a homosexual. So you never loved me. Is that what you're saying? That these past five years didn't mean anything to you? Past five years? Your husband's been in a gay relationship with his partner who he apparently has been living with for the past three years. What is the nature of your marriage? The two work in a cafe, but Ben has a degree in nursing, while Arthur wants to get a business degree to open a porno shop of all things. You have a degree in nursing, you know, what, what the heck are you doing here? Good question. Do you want more? Yes. Hey, I want more. I'm sorry. I just filled it. There's a whole two inches left. So why didn't she ask for more initially, and why didn't he fill it to the top the first time? Like, he's not very good at his job, and she's an idiot. Worst comes to worst, if I have to go back to work as a nurse, that's cool. Imagine having the freedom to work in the industry of nursing where you're actually making an important difference and instead choosing to be a dishwasher in a cafe that you just can't stand working at. It's almost like the filmmakers needed a more affordable location to shoot this movie because the hospital was just out of their range. Arthur goes to search for a new job with little success, including trying out for a gay club where his dance audition is done to poor lighting and no music. <laughs> Cut. I didn't need to see that. That's great. No, it's not. Now, uh, let's see your penis. The scene just ends there. The film doesn't make it clear whether Arthur refused to take his dick out, which he would have to do if he was going to be working as an exotic dancer, or whether he took it out and it just wasn't big enough. That random plot point just got dropped in there and then completely forgotten about. Sound familiar? I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. Yeah. Don't fucking litter, you degenerate. I thought you were meant to be the protagonist. I was calling in regards to the ad I saw in the paper for the apartment. You have an apartment. I thought you were looking for a job. Are you Victor? <laughs> well, yes. I can, can I help you? Hey, Vic. It's, it's me, your brother, Arthur. You just get stranger and stranger and stranger. Arthur? I... Uh... I haven't seen you in, what, at least seven years? Victor is a classic conservative religious figure, always keeping a Bible close to his heart. I need $2,000 for my tuition to college. Are you still haunted by these demons? What's that? I mean, are you still a homosexual, is what I mean. Those demons. I found a great man, and we're getting married. And he really inspires me to want to improve my life. I hope he inspires you to improve your filmmaking, Sam. If I'll give you $8,000 if you bring this man over here to this apartment and respect me and respect this apartment and respect the Lord Jesus Christ. R -E -S -P -C -T. What do you think wrote this? I don't know, what do you think? Another thing about Ben and Arthur is the audio is so poorly edited that occasionally it'll just drop out completely. I don't see why we can't go see an attorney here in California and get married here. Why do we have to go all the way to Vermont? Okay, I know a great lawyer in Beverly Hills. We can give him a call. Nick Manut. I'll see what I can do to help you guys out. Rewind! We can give him a call. We can give him a call. We can give him a call. He's a he! They decide to go to Vermont to get wed in a civil union. Which they do at a wedding which literally nobody shows up for. Uh, I'm happy to have done. You don't look happy. What's wrong? Nobody in this film looks happy and I don't blame them. So, the civil union license that you have from Vermont must be recognized here in California probably reading the script right now. Then Victor hires a private investigator who reveals himself following an awkward car park shot which is the worst example of cinematography in this film so far. It's so shaky and unstable. And it shouldn't be, they have a tripod. We saw the tripod in a previous shot. My brother is a homosexual. He's gonna be marrying a man. <laughs> I need to find out what his next move is. Something gay, no doubt. All right, I'll keep in touch. This is such a lazy method of transitioning. No, no self-respecting filmmaker could do two days later just like that. Justin Abraham. Yeah, you're getting some information for me. Yeah. Yes, I believe that was established from your prior exchange. Then Victor super casually bursts into the car park and murders a random woman. If you're a little confused watching the review right now, just so you know, you're still going to be confused when you're watching the actual film. This entire scene is really strange. And of course it ends by just cutting to an awkward dinner conversation. So Arthur, when do you plan to have kids? No, I'm sure as soon as uh, Arthur gets a beautiful wife and children, then that's when 
He'll have a nice family. It's gonna correct Arthur. P people don't talk like that. Victor, I'm gay. I already told you that. <laughs> They're actually eating what looks like pop tarts for dinner. That's all they could afford on this movie. Dinner biscuits. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> this film's sorry excuse for dialogue, this sorry excuse for acting, the sorry excuse for the meals the characters are eating in this scene. I mean, for fuck's sakes. The biscuits! If you destroy this for Bible study five days a week, we could uh, take care of that for you and clean, cleanse that sinfulness of yours. I'm never gonna have any nieces or nephews ever because you know what? You're so fucked up, you know that? For a religious man, you sure swear a lot, Victor, but then again, religion is built very heavily upon hypocrisy. You fuck! Will you watch your ruddy language? My ears are not a toilet. You want nieces and nephews? Well, I've got news for you, buddy. I'm not your buddy, friend. He's not your friend, guy. I'm not your guy, buddy. He's not your buddy, friend. You care more about some man named Jesus that you've never even met before than your own family. Some man named Jesus that you've never even met before. I, I don't think Sam Ravitch actually put this script through a second draft. I think he just wrote whatever came into his mind and was like, yep, done, start filming. He shouldn't have done that. That's not a good idea. We're leaving. We're leaving. Let's go. Let's go. How about you stop repeating what the other person says? I'm gonna pray for you, and I'm gonna pray for you. We don't need prayed for. You need prayed for. <laughs> they go home and engage in possibly the worst sex scene ever put on screen. Most people argue that that honor is reserved for the room, but as terrible as those scenes are, I'd much rather watch Tommy Wiseau bang Lisa's belly button than watch Arthur repeatedly stroke Ben's back. Remember me? What are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? You want him to tell you why you inexplicably rocked up at his apartment with a gun. I mean, obviously you've got issues, but... But come on. What did you come over here for? Well, I've got news for you, buddy. Stop shaking! Why are you shaking? I'll be gay too, and then that'll make it right for us to get married again, huh? That's not how it works. You're not making any sense! And that line right there, that perfectly sums up the entire film. I don't make sense, you don't make sense! I make sense, that's who makes sense! Is she retarded? I didn't come over and put a gun in your face. No, no, you didn't. No, that's right, I didn't. You came over and you stuck a knife in my heart, huh? Actually, this is his apartment, so you came over. The scene devolves into an awkward struggle to gain control of the gun, which reminds me heavily of two scenes from The Room. The scene where Mark and Johnny fight with Chris R to take the gun from him, and the fight between Mark and Johnny from the end. It's peculiar how often this film keeps reminding me of The Room in so many oddly specific moments. I thought you loved me. He's gay, and you pulled a gun on him, Realistically, what is your idea of love? Well, Ben, I got some groceries. Whoa, man. <laughs> Fuck off! Where did that thing come from? Well, your country doesn't have gun control, so it could have come from anywhere. My ex-wife demanded that I marry her again. Yeah, what was her plan? Force him to marry her again at gunpoint and then keep that gun pointed at his head for the rest of their life and marriage? Like, I don't think she plotted that scheme out particularly well. She ripped my shirt, my sweater, I gotta go change. She very clearly did not rip your shirt or sweater, there is no sign of damage there. We gotta go to the police, man. I don't know. I, she could try this again, she could be nuts like my brother. I think that'll be the last time we'll see her, I think she just needs to cool down. So even though this girl rocked up at their apartment and literally pulled a gun on Ben and was prepared to kill him, they don't go to the police. And that's the end of that plot point, it literally never comes back in the film. I got you a uh, life insurance policy. For what? Well, in case something happens to me, or if I get killed in any way, you get a million dollars. And that plot point is semi-irrelevant, but it comes back, and not for a good reason. Thanks. Bye-bye. So who was that? Our attorney's secretary. Someone killed her. And this is the moment where it clicked for me. That random woman that was murdered earlier, that was their attorney. But in her murder scene, it is so difficult to discern who she actually is. Because the film is so poorly shot that you'll miss major plot points because of bad cinematography. That is a very special type of filmmaking error. Mildred, what do you want? There's been a break-in in the garage, and the managers asked me to tell everybody okay, to go check their phones. And there's another special mistake, cutting someone off mid-sentence, not for dramatic effect, just because you don't know how to fucking edit a movie. Come on, Sam. My bike is gone. 
What? You locked it up, didn't you? I asked you to lock it up for me last time, remember? Well... I thought I locked it up. <sighs> Damn it, Arthur! I need to know that I can count on you! And that's the one moment of emotion you'll actually get from Ben in the film. Walk away, bitch. Arthur. Would you please let me in? Let me in. Let me in! I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you and blow up like that. Well, you did, Ben. You hurt me. You know that? You hurt me. I'm sorry, why is it about you all of a sudden? Your carelessness is the reason that Ben's bike got stolen. Don't make it about you, you self-indulgent prick. And another thing I never told you. Do you remember the day we went to that restaurant to celebrate when you came out of the closet? And now you want to pull out an irrelevant story from years ago just to guilt trip Ben? Fucking hell, Arthur is actually a toxic character. God, Ben needs to get away from him. What did you say when I grabbed your hand and I kissed you on the cheek when we were walking out? I don't know. You pulled your hand out of mine, you turned your head, and you said, Not here! I never said that. Oh, you did, Ben. You most certainly did. And my heart, my stomach, I mean, my liver, everything. It just fell right out onto the floor. Your liver? Really? Um, I don't think anybody has ever said that sentence before. Well, you know, if it bothered you so much and you felt so strongly about it, why didn't you say something then? Exactly! And, and say what? Why don't you come out of the closet? Sorry, let's just backtrack here. Do you remember the day we went to that restaurant to celebrate when you came out of the closet? A few inches later. And, and say what? Why don't you come out of the closet? So he'd already come out of the closet. That kind of nullifies the entire point of this guilt trip, Arthur, you fucking asshole. Well, you know, Ben, if I ever get killed, maybe you can take that insurance money and just go ahead and buy a hundred bikes. Shut the fuck up. You're a fucking cunt. Oh. Okay, so Ben's an asshole as well. This is the gay version of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. I'm sorry, Bob. His name is Arthur. Well, that'll teach you to not say stupid things. That line is a character actually attempting to justify domestic abuse. These are terrible people. Well, I have a secret holy water recipe that you can give Arthur that will cleanse of all his demons that possess him and turn straight. Secret holy water recipe. You know, this thing just reminds me of a clip from The Simpsons. Legend has it my great-grandpappy stumbled upon this recipe when he was trying to invent a cheap substitute for holy water. Then Victor goes to Ben and Arthur's to literally just duct tape the potion to the door before running away. Let's review. If you came home to your apartment and you found a weird liquid substance just duct taped to the door with no note whatsoever, is your first instinct going to be to drink it? No, probably not. So if you wanted to trick someone into drinking something, you'd probably have to pull a Bill Cosby on them. Not that I advocate that in any way, shape, or form. Don't do that. Look at this. What is it? It's some stupid potion for my brother. It's supposed to free demons out of your soul when you drink it. And just how did you know that? Yo, pick up the phone. What's up? What's up? What you doing, son? It, the potion didn't work. Can you believe it? Yes, I very easily can. Okay, I'm gonna have to resort to the final plan. Oh shit, buddy. Victor goes to his local church where you can see what appears to be a slightly misshapen cardboard crucifix as a set piece. The priest tells Victor that he isn't welcome in the church anymore because he has a gay brother. I know this whole plot point is melodramatic and over the top, but this is the most realistic thing in the film. Churches, they do be like this. you to help me to kill my brother. Do you know uh, Martha Wellner? Why did you say that there? She was prosecuted for killing her son. Yeah, isn't there something in the Bible about not killing? I mean, I don't know, I never read it myself. I have read another fictional story by a famous religious figure. I read Battlefield Earth by L. Ron Hubbard. It was okay for the first 320 pages. Naturally, the church assists him with his murderous plans while Ben and Arthur relax by a depressing poolside. This is great. This is really relaxing. Also, take notice of the fact that Ben took off his jacket in the last scene and suddenly it's back on. Terrible. Take a lap. Okay, bye. 
ambulance. Who was that? That was the hospital. They need me to get back there. Two of the nurses quit. Oh, you're back working there now? Did uh, we forget to film that scene? But we just got here, Ben. I know. This is our honeymoon. It must be so depressing to be a part of this relationship if this is what meets the standard of being a honeymoon. They threw me out of the church because you're my brother and because you're gay. That's why they threw me out. Well, you should probably find a church that knows the true meaning of love and understanding. That is actually the only sensible line said in the entire film. Because I hired a private investigator. A what? Yeah, a private investigator. And he told me that you're running a porno shop. That never happened. He was supposed to go to college and get his business degree so he could do that, but he couldn't find the money to get into college because Victor wouldn't lend it to him. Now you see this? Put some lube on it and shove it up your ass. What is it gonna take you to realize that you've gotta get up, you've gotta divorce that guy? Look. That line had no place in the script, but I actually approve of that one. You've got to accept Jesus as your savior. Do you better divorce that guy? Look. Now I know that divorce is a sin, so that means you're asking this guy to divorce someone, commit an actual sin, so that he can stop being gay, which isn't even actually a sin. So that's religious hypocrisy on full display, and it's uh, it's coming from someone who also murdered an attorney earlier. But the film just kind of forgot about that, didn't it? Well, after he's out shopping, this random guy joins Victor to go and murder Ben off screen. Ben. Hey, Ben! Ben! Hey! Ben! Sincerity's overwhelming. I think I'm gonna wait. Apparently he survives anyway, and a cop comes to investigate both Victor and the priest, but this never amounts to anything. And Arthur busts into Victor's to bug his phone. Now where have I seen that before? I show them. I record everything. Get. Out. Now. Where'd you get that from? Columbine High School, Virginia Tech University, Sandy Hook Elementary, a Proud Boys rally. And this little puppy is the same one I used to kill that little faggot friend of yours when you were little. We're just gonna condense random plot points into single sentence exposition now? You're a sick cunt, you know that? That's meant to be an insult, but in Australia, that's actually a huge compliment. You're either a sick cunt or a shit cunt. Yeah, hello? Father Raven? Uncle Leo? <laughs> Arthur listens into the conversation and realizes the involvement of the church. Yeah, he called me a fucking cunt. Can you believe it? My own brother. You tried to kill his husband, so yes, I can very easily believe that. Arthur goes to the church and casually chloroforms the priest, which is slightly ironic when you think about it. Then he pours some kind of flammable liquid all over him before dropping a match. And of course the scene just cuts there. Fire wasn't in the film's budget. Not even stock footage of some random fire. Now, I know this film is willing to borrow songs from the public domain, so... Why didn't they get footage of something on fire? Victor goes to the apartment and shoots Ben, and the death scene is definitely the worst edited scene in the entire film. From the stock sound effects to the fake blood makeup and the discombobulating crossfades, it's all an ugly mess. And there isn't even any dialogue to go with it. I did Ben a favor. I saved his soul. Hey, God! No, he turned it sideways. Kill shot! Victor orders Arthur to get naked and then just goes to sit down in the other room. And Arthur takes the chance to get up and get dressed. I don't think I've ever looked in this drawer. Wow, a gun! <laughs> then there's a prolonged awkward sequence where Arthur goes to try and seduce his own brother. You wanna fuck me, don't you, Victor? Just when I think you've said the stupidest thing ever, you keep talking. What the hell was that? I know about the life insurance policy. Looks, it's one million dollars. One million dollars because, because I killed Ben. No! No! The life insurance policy was in Arthur's name. The money is only available for Ben if Arthur dies, but you killed Ben. I don't know if the characters got that confused or if the writers got that confused, but I figured it out! Come on, Victor. Come here and fuck me now before it's too late. This entire scene feels like it was inspired by the ending scene in Scarface. When Tony Montana's sister comes in half naked, shooting at him, accusing him of wanting her all to himself. I don't know why Scarface of all things seems to be the inspiration here, but Master of Disguise made a much better reference to that movie. Someone say hello to my little friend. Don't touch. If you thought the room went out with a bang, you clearly haven't seen the climax of Ben and Arthur. As the two brothers lay there dying, the film just ends, right there and then, incredibly abruptly. Is Ben and Arthur a good film? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's obvious from the get-go that Ben and Arthur is a film made by people who have no business making films. 
And yet, Sam Raovich insisted on doing so many jobs and didn't get a single one right. This is a film bereft of any plot whatsoever and packed with loose subplots that never actually develop anywhere. The acting is either completely empty or over the top, the dialogue is tacky, the characters are all toxic in some way or another, and the cinematography is just a bone. Movies like this piss me off so much because if you don't know how to film a movie with any technique, don't make the fucking movie. Don't just put the camera down there on a tripod and then try to make it last 90 minutes. All the comments you could make about the characters and writing are also comments you could make about The Room. But there is a huge difference between these two movies. The Room was made with genuine heartfelt sincerity. It's full of quotable dialogue and even if the actors phone it in, there's still a certain likability to them. But with Ben and Arthur, it's got none of that. Obviously Ben and Arthur has the best intentions, it wants to tell a story about the struggles of contemporary homophobia, and it goes to some pretty extremist lengths to do so. Unfortunately, with its poorly structured narrative and rather unlikable characters, it becomes difficult to identify with anyone. Even the heroes Ben and Arthur spend so much time in the film being backed into the corner so you can pity them, but they're so bereft of any actual characterization that you'll be laughing at them before pitying them. This film may interest you with its large hybrid of plot holes, technical issues and lack of technique, but it's so repetitive with its badness and bereft of sincerity that it can get boring really fast. It was a struggle to get through this film. If I was watching this movie after having a few drinks and surrounded by people who wanted to make sarcastic comments with me, I'm sure I could have a fun time with it. But to review it for this show, I need to watch it solo in a place where I can analyze and review it. And spending time doing that, it didn't bring me pleasure. Exposing myself to this movie was... It just was not a good time. I will say though that I can see Ben and Arthur being a good companion piece to The Room if you watch the two movies as a double feature. Both films make similar decisions in filmmaking, being both objectively terrible romantic dramas with the same standard of acting and writing. But The Room will actually make you feel something other than boredom and it'll be a cold day in hell before Ben and Arthur leaves that impression on the viewer. The best thing that you can say about Ben and Arthur is that Sam Raovich actually got a feature length film made. So you can give props to anyone who actually manages to achieve that. Even though it's such an ugly mess, and it's full of so many errors, he's embraced that. Mravich has actually stated that all the filmmaking errors have given this film such a notorious reputation in the cult circuit that he's happy. He's glad his film is getting seen, even if it's for how bad it is. So, I guess there is a happy ending to this movie. Ben and Arthur gets one dinner biscuit out of ten. It is a messy affair of disjointed plot points, terrible writing, pseudo acting, and awful production values. But unfortunately, it doesn't have the same heartfelt sincerity to give it any kind of legacy akin to The Room. And that does it for today's episode of Delightfully Devilish, you guys. If you want to see more episodes of this show, please hit that subscribe button. If there are any movies you want to see me discuss on this show, please leave them in the comment section below. Otherwise, until next time, I have been your host, Jukebox Harry. Peace.